I'm Harriet Vanceball, Associate Professor of Medicine from McMaster University, and I'm excited to discuss the DAPA HF trial today with Professor McMurray. John. <laughs> Thank you, John. Um, so DAPA HF um, was perhaps one of the most important clinical trials in heart failure with reduced EF this year, and the primary outcome was presented at ESC. But we're here at HA to discuss some of the sub-studies and the sensitivity analyses uh, to tackle uh, whether there were specific populations that benefited from dapagliflozin in the setting of heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. So there was an exciting presentation this morning that dealt with um, the diabetes population and uh, analyzed whether diabetics and non-diabetics derived equal benefit from the intervention. Why don't you tell us about the methodology and the results of that? Correct. So you're absolutely right, Harriet. I mean, the, the trial that we did really had two principal objectives. One was to see whether these, what had previously been diabetes drugs, might be used to treat heart failure, not to prevent it, we knew that from other studies, but to treat patients with established heart failure. But the second, and as you point out, maybe more innovative hypothesis was might these glucose-lowering drugs e work even in patients without type 2 diabetes. So we designed a trial that included HEF-REF patients, both with and without diabetes, 55% of our patients mm -hmm. did not have type 2 diabetes at baseline. In fact, we uh, randomized people, we stratified people uh, by diabetes status when we randomized them. So it's almost like this was a trial within a trial looking at the patients with diabetes and separately looking at the patients without diabetes. And as you said, today uh, my presentation focused on those individuals who did not have type 2 diabetes at baseline, would they get the same benefit from this drug that mm -hmm. previously had only been considered to lower blood glucose? And the simple answer is yes, they did. There was a 27% relative risk reduction in the primary composite outcome. That was a worsening heart failure mm -hmm. event or cardiovascular death in the patients without diabetes and a 25% relative risk reduction in the patients with diabetes, an entirely consistent benefit. And that was really the same for all the other endpoints that we looked at, mortality, cardiovascular mortality, heart failure, hospitalization, even symptoms. The patients without diabetes were more likely to have an improvement in their symptoms with dapagliflozin than patients randomized to placebo, and they were less likely to have a deterioration in their symptoms with dapagliflozin compared to placebo. And then, of course, safety is very important. Absolutely. We were concerned, obviously, giving a glucose-lowering drug right. potentially to patients who don't have diabetes. In fact, there was no change in haemoglobin A1c in the patients without diabetes. So again, that speaks to clearly this not being a glucose-mediated benefit. And when we looked at safety, um, the patients without diabetes were less likely to get adverse effects than patients with diabetes, probably no surprise. Mm -hmm. um, volume depletion was uncommon, renal dysfunction was uncommon, and neither was more common mm -hmm. in the DAPA group than in the placebo group. And in the patients without diabetes, there were no cases of serious hypoglycemia, no cases of diabetic ketoacidosis, and very few people had to stop treatment because of adverse events. So overall, uh, we were really amazed to see that in patients without diabetes, and by the way, that was true, we also showed today an analysis looking at he, uh, glycated haemoglobin, haemoglobin right. A1c is a sort of continuous measure and whether you had a completely normal glycated haemoglobin, whether you had a pre-diabetic haemoglobin A1c or whether you had type 2 diabetes, the benefit was entirely consistent and that was on top of really good conventional therapy. Absolutely. Um, I think that uh, one of the questions that has come up in many discussions is the proportion of patients in DAPA HF that were on angiotensin uh, receptor nebulizin, um, uh, antagonists 
Um, and so angiotensin receptor blocker, niprolysin uh, inhibitors, I should say. Um, and uh, people wonder whether uh, dapagliflozin should be added on uh, after um, ARNIs have been optimized or whether they can be uh, simultaneously uptitrated. Uh, can, can ARNIs be uptitrated while a patient is on dapagliflozin? What are your thoughts on this? And an important question for clinicians. Absolutely, and, and you point out why we abbreviated these drugs to ARNIs. Right, <laughs> absolutely. Uh, so uh, unfortunately, we only had at baseline 11% of our patients on sucubitril valsartan because it was just being introduced into practice. Although the interesting thing is even when we looked, when we looked at that small subgroup, the benefit of dapagliflozin was entirely consistent in patients on sucubitril valsartan compared to those not getting sucubitril valsartan. So these are complementary treatments. Mm -hmm. Their benefits are additive. That's not surprising, I think, because they work in entirely different sort of mechanistic ways. So you're correct, we're now faced with the problem of how do you put all of these drugs? I mean, we've now got five drugs that reduce mortality in heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. How do you sequence them? How do you add them? Right. In some healthcare systems, there's, there's the problem of affordability. Absolutely. Uh, so I suppose the both sucubitril valsartan in paradigm heart failure and dapagliflozin in DAPA-HF were added to what you might consider the bedrock of uh, optimum pharmacological therapy for HEFREF. So by bedrock, those pillars, I would say, are a RAS blocker, a beta blocker, and a mineralocorticoid receptor antagonist. So both paradigm heart failure, DAPA-HF, we had excellent background treatment with those three, three drugs. And then we were either adding an eprilysin inhibitor or we were adding an SGLT2 inhibitor. And I think that probably means you could choose to use one or the other. Um, but I think optimally, if the patient can tolerate it and if affordability isn't an issue, you would like patients to be on both of those treatments because frankly that will give them the best chance of being alive and well uh, in the next few years. Now how, why one might choose one over the other I suppose if we think about it dapagliflozin has a much smaller effect on blood pressure doesn't cause as much hypotension so a hypotensive patient mm -hmm. might be one where you might choose an SGLT2 inhibitor over sucubitril valsartan initially. Um, you mentioned, uh, I think, that these drugs uh, can have a diuretic effect because they increase urinary sodium and water excretion along with glucose excretion. I suppose in a more congested patient, it might make sense to start with an SGLT2 inhibitor, but then hopefully add Sucubitril so valsartan, clearly in a patient who's more hypertensive than sucubitril so valsartan would make a lot of sense to start with. And then both drugs seem to have a renal protective effect. Right. So again, you've got a choice in, in that particularly difficult and complicated and high risk patient who's got both heart failure and chronic kidney disease. Fantastic. I wonder before we end if you could uh, discuss your findings across the age spectrum of patients enrolled in DAPA-HF and whether dapagliflozin affords equal benefit across age groups or whether one was more likely to drive benefit if they were older versus younger. Yeah, very good question because of course our trials always seem to enroll younger patients than we look after in routine practice in North America and Western Europe because mm -hmm. our patients tend to be older than in other parts of the world. So we were fortunate we had uh, quite a, a large fraction of older patients in our study. In fact, the oldest patient was 94 years of age. And uh, we've just published online in circulation along with a presentation here, our findings according to age. The I think the two most important messages are firstly that efficacy 
was similar across the whole spectrum of age. Amazingly, we saw the same relative risk reduction in quite elderly patients as we did in younger patients. But of course, because older patients are at higher absolute risk, that relative risk reduction translated into an even bigger absolute risk reduction in older patients. We were concerned, I think, because most people are concerned about giving lots of drugs to older patients, that safety might be an issue. And in fact, we didn't find that to be the case at all. Yes, older patients have more adverse effects, but they had more adverse effects in the placebo group. Right. Uh, and there was no difference between dapagliflozin and placebo across the age spectrum. And if anything, particularly uh, with reference to renal adverse events, they were less common in the DAPA group than the placebo group, especially in older patients. So we were again pleasantly surprised by that nice balance between benefits and harm in even older patients. Last question before we leave. The majority of patients had NYHA class 2 and 3 Correct. symptoms. Um, would you start this drug in hospitalized patients? So we've not done that trial, right. but uh, speaking in a personal capacity, in my own experience and practice, yes, I do and I would. Uh, I always think that starting disease modifying treatments before hospital discharge is a great opportunity for two reasons. One is when that patient leaves the front door of the hospital, they're entering an extremely high risk period for both death and readmission. And secondly, sadly, even in the best healthcare systems, people get forgotten about, get lost to follow up. All the best plans you had to uh, titrate dose and add new therapies all get forgotten about. So you've got the patient there in front of you. You can monitor their blood pressure. You can monitor their electrolytes, their renal function. It's a great opportunity to get all of these treatments started. Fantastic. So dapagliflozin offers benefit across uh, the spectrum of age Correct. to diabetics and non-diabetics, regardless of HbA1c level. Correct. And hospitalization might afford an opportune moment to initiate patients on therapy, although that has yet to be tested in a clinical trial. Thank you so much Thank for you. joining me today. <laughs> it was my pleasure meeting you. Thank you very much. Thanks.